today we have Jersey's own former light heavyweight and cruiserweight champion of the world, arguably one of the best light heavyweight and cruiserweights in history, and also also a genius, a Mensa off the tar- charts genius, Bobby Chez will be joining us. I love Jersey, I love Bobby, let's get into this. So, Mr. Chez, former light heavyweight, heavy and heavyweight, uh, light heavyweight and cruiserweight champion. Cruiserweight, light heavyweight, cruiserweight, and super cruiserweight. There we go. Super, what what weight is super cruiser? Super cruiser was uh, well, you had you know the cruiser was one ninety was the limit. Yeah. They had o- over one ninety to like uh, two hundred six. Okay. Really, they should they should have done that in my when I was fighting. I was just you had, you I was had a couple more titles. <laughs> and, um, we had uh, we had a comment. Mm-hmm. We had one of your opponents on our podcast a couple weeks ago or a month ago, um, Donnie Lalon, who you picked up your cruiserweight title defeating. Well, I yeah, he tried to get my title, but no, I beat him up pretty good. You did, you did, <laughs> you did, and he was, he, you know, I feel like he never got the props he deserved because he was no, he wasn't a bum. He was a good fighter, you know. He was, he was a bum. Nice. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Unfortunately, people see boxing as a, somewhat of a one-dimensional thing. It really isn't. See, good is your ability to give an ass whooping. Tough is your ability to take an ass whooping. Donnie was not too bad at giving one, but he couldn't take one to save his life. He was not so tough. He couldn't, no. he couldn't stand the heat, no. huh? He couldn't take the heat? Not the heat. He couldn't take the punches. You know, you yeah. know what's, you know what's funny? So me and Jeremy met at Kevin Rooney. We were Kevin, in Kevin Rooney's camp. And I was watching you fight. And how tall are you, buddy? 5'10". 5'10". So I'm watching you fight, and you had a similar kind of style where I, I remember thinking to myself, maybe you would have benefited from that kind of, 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 of style. But then I'm watching you more and more, and I'm realizing, you know, I don't think it would have benefited you because you had your own style, and, and you were very good and very smart at seeing openings and making punches land. Well, it's interesting that you that you observe that because I'll tell you what happened to me when I fought for the cruiserweight title. I fought a guy named Robert Daniels who was two into two inches shorter than me. I misjudged his strength watching all those videos for hours and hours and hours and hours. I misjudged his strength, physical strength, and also the power. So I walk out there with a certain strategy that I've trained for 17 weeks for. And now all of a sudden I come back after the first round and say, Tommy, this ain't going to work. Mm-hmm. I had to change. Now, here's what I had to do. <clears throat> a lot of people don't know this because it, it never really creeped into my professional career because I was always big, thick legs. I was a little short for my weight. But when I was a youngster, 103, 115, 125, 147, I used to box like Ali. I used to box from the outside, jabbing, stepping around, my, moving, jabbing, jabbing. And I realized that when I fought Daniels, this ain't going to work. <clears throat> This ain't going to work. I got to change. So I made the changes in the corner. I told Tommy, now here's what happens when you make changes that you're not prepared for. After the ninth round of my of the fight, I came back to the corner and my, my feet were bleeding through my shoes. Ooh. And Tommy Park said, what the hell's going on? I said, <clears throat> I think the skin rubbed off my feet. I, I'm, I'm in pain. I can't walk any. I can't walk without pain. Ooh. So what do you want to do? I said, I got no choice. I promised my wife was my fiance at the time. So I promised Kimberly she was marrying the cruiserweight champ in September, so in October. So this is what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, long and short of it, I went out there. The tenth round was my best round, and I won the title. Yeah, I mean, we we saw that you began as a middleweight, correct? Correct. And wow. I assume this is my assumption is the reason why you probably suffered your first loss was it was probably impossible for you to make that weight and drain yourself. That'd be my guess. <laughs> That was one of the reasons that it was, it was a, it was a culmination of things. But when I came out of the amateurs, I was fighting at 165, which was super, super middleweight in the, in the pros. Mm-hmm. So for the first couple of years of my career, I was sucking off that extra five pounds and eventually it started to make me weaker and weaker. 
when I fought Ham Show, I even I even asked Lou Duva for he gave me a water pill. Well, that was a that was a really dumb thing to do. <laughs> but on top of that, in the second round, I broke my hand when I hit him in the forehead. It broke the first two metacarpals broke through the top of my hand. Oh, so now I'm, now I'm in a little bit of a jam. But uh, I also got a little weak. I wasn't strong. I just didn't have a good day. Mm. Uh, at the same time, having said that, I think Mustafa Hamp show was too experienced for me and too strong at 160. If I had fought him at 175, he never he'd never finished the fight. See yeah. what I told you, Marco? That's what I. That's exactly what I told Marco. <clears throat> Question: Your first professional fight, Hank Whitmore. How would you feel? How would I say again? How How'd you feel? It was your first professional fight. Well, you you know you have a certain amount of nervous anxiety. Plus, the entire you know ice world was a big state, big arena for locals. Mm -hmm. It held them <clears throat> held over three thousand five hundred people. My whole high school was there, <laughs> and they were all screaming, "Bobby, Bobby!" So it was a lot of pressure to, to at least look good. And knocking them out in the first round wasn't bad. So you're a yeah, you're absolutely. a you're a Jersey guy, born and raised. Born and raised. And what got you in the boxing? Yeah. All right, this is a. Simple story, but it sounds a little more complicated than it is. When I was very young, I was 10 years old. I lived in East Ar Orange and East Orange from uh, born till 10. Now, I lived in the hood, though. I mean, I lived in a really poor section. We were poor. Me too. And I went to school with black and Hispanic, so I was fighting every day because I was a minority. Everybody was picking on me. Yeah, well, roles were reversed. Me too. No big deal. I, I, I lived with it. But as I moved to Wanakew, my dad told me and my brothers, Vince and Tony, he, he was there, they were nine and seven at the time. You guys are going to go to Patterson six days a week to and learn how to box. And I said, what if we don't want to? He said, there's no, you don't have a choice. I'll kick your yeah. ass. I know the feeling. And my father would have done that. So he took us down to Patterson where we started to train every day, Monday through Saturday. We got Sundays off. We started running, doing training. So for five years, I was <clears> doing it. My brothers were doing it. And after five years, he gave us the option to quit. And unbeknownst to a lot of the world, I'm not religious. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in an afterlife. And when I was 15 years old, I was <laughs> boxing with I was boxing with and beating up guys and handling guys that were rated in the top 50 in the world as, as pros. And I thought to myself, wait, if I could do this as a 15-year-old boy, what could I do as a man? Mm -hmm. So I asked yeah. my I asked my dad to let me stay with the boxing. And sometime thereafter, shortly thereafter, at the age of 18, I turned pro. And at the age of 24, I, I realized my dream. I was in the, literally, I was in the hist sports history books forever, for eternity, as the light heavyweight champion of the world. And that's what, that's what, that's what fueled my fire to fight. Okay. okay. I, wanted to be, I wanted to be special. I wanted to leave behind a footprint on this planet. Nothing wrong with that, brother. Nothing wrong with that. And you know, you <clears throat> you did, man. You were, you know, when whenever boxing conversations come up about the greatest cruiserweight, for some reason, people usually mention you as cruiserweight, one of the best cruiserweights. Which you kind of didn't spend most of your career there, right? You kind of were. No, like, so I only I only had a few fights as cruiserweight, um, and then I got an opportunity for super cruiserweight which I jump started to, to a big payday. I was looking to get a million dollar payday, which I never got. The biggest was Holyfield was three, 350. So, uh, but I think, I think my best weight though, naturally was 175. Really? Yeah. Wow. Really? And then we, uh, we read about that, um, that, that really fucked up uh, the, the 1980 uh, amateur team, but that, the, that you and Tony Tucker happened to miss that, that, that plane or that flight that ended up going down. I mean, what do you remember about that? There were a few people who missed the plane. And I remember when I got in the car accident, I got in the car accident December, just well, I remember, December 27th, 1979, two days after Christmas. Okay. And I had a broken nose. I was bleeding and I was pretty messed up. And my father came home from work the day I did it. And when I was sitting in a chair holding the ice, I was holding the ice with my right hand uh, on my nose and everything was broken and my face was cut up. He stepped around to this side and punched me in the face knocked me off the chair and the garbage pail. So I got back up and I figured I'll put the left hand up so he hits, he hits my elbow. So he stepped around, hit me with the left hook, knocked me over the table. I said, I'm not, I, then I got up and went in the bathroom and shut the door. I said, I'm not, I'm not getting killed. Why? But it was a mistake because I got in a car accident. And here's the thing, but well, because it was, the trip was special because 
my last name is obviously unusual. It's yeah. Polish. My grandfather was from Poland, Warsaw. So I had a lot of relatives in Warsaw. <coughs> and I have three grandparents from Italy. So I'm three quarters Italian, a quarter Polish. Basically, I make myself an offer I can't even understand. But <laughs> I, I, had to, I, had to, yeah, had to, I had to throw that one in there for you. But no, um, he, he was so upset with me. And here's the funny thing. Come March the following year, when the plane went down, I got home from school. My father called the house. I'll never forget this. And my mother said, it's your father. It's, it's your father. It's for you. And I was like, oh, geez, he's probably going to rip me. I know the fights were supposed to start and everything. So I get on the phone. He said, son, you know that flight you were supposed to be on to Poland? I said, yeah, dad. What about it? He said, they're all dead. Jesus. Every wow. single one of them, they're all dead. When I tell you it's a chill went up my spine, I froze. <clears throat> it, was, it was the strangest feeling I'd ever had in my life. Wow. To know that I, I was slated to be dead. And if not for the car accident, I would be gone. Wow. And the, the, with the car accident, what was that? Like, was it, was it your fault, their fault, accident? What I, just fell I, I just fell asleep and it was late. I just fell uh -huh. asleep. Drove off the road, didn't leave, have a seatbelt on, hit my nose on the steering wheel, broke it, and cut my face up pretty bad. Wow. Wow. Um, Better than cashing in your ticket, that's for sure. And uh, Jeremy, so who was the common opponent you guys both had? You guys had one common opponent, you and Jeremy. George O'Mara. Oh, my God. George, oh, he, oh, he, he could take a punch, boy. <laughs> That's what Jeremy I told said. you, Mark. I told you. He, he could, could take he a could. punch. I broke his nose twice in the same fight. <laughs> Man, I beat the brakes off the guy, and he gave me a hug after the fight. He goes, uh, yeah, no, he was, he, was a good, he was a good guy. Great, yeah. Great. But he was great tough, as, tough as tough as tough as could. Well, again, I tell you, the, the ability, tough as your ability to take an ass whooping, good as your ability to give one. He was tough, all right. He could take it, but he couldn't give it out that much. He, he, he couldn't. He couldn't pay him to be the man. That guy was. I, he was tough, man. And we actually brought him back for sparring partner. Just he uh, was a human punching bag. Man. You know, at, over the years, I did that with a lot of guys that I fought and beat. I brought them back as sparring partners. Really, yeah, we did. We did. We, yeah. And, well, wow. you, you know, you can never get you can never get too good a sparring partner. Um, that's how you. Get, that's how you get ready for the fights. Man, I uh, I had a sparring partner one time who looked like Evander Holyfield. His name was Everton Davis. You couldn't kick that. Oh, yeah, I know him. Man, Everton <laughs> Davis. Big old, big old Jamaican black guy. I mean, yeah. super great guy, but really, like, really nice guy. I brought him in for a lot of fights. But when I fought him, I was like, God, damn, I feel like I was fighting. I felt like I was fighting Holyfield. It looked one just of the like guys. One of the guys I used to spar with used to give me fits because he was so quick it was Maurice Harris, a guy you also fought. And yeah, that, that was one of the best left, left hooks I've ever seen. Really? That, really? that was, I mean, that was, I, didn't, I don't even know how he got up. Yeah, me but too. He, he, didn't beat the, he didn't beat the count, though. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I, was, you yeah. Know, I was going over some of your fights, and one fight in particular, the Virgil Hill fight. Now, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like you – it was very close. I feel like you even could have won that fight. And don't forget that that knockdown was ruled a slip, which it clearly was not a slip. You dropped him clean. Even after the fight, even after the fight, Virgil said, no, that was a clean knockdown. Because uh, the ref – you know, the ref the, – yeah, excuse me, the announcer said, how did you feel about the – was that a knockdown? He said, oh, yeah, it was. Well, you know what, Virgil was real quick, and I, I just – he was so quick, I couldn't really adjust to him. I, I got to him once. He never let me get to him again, and I, I tip my hat to him. He deserved the decision, but they, it was a one-sided decision, and the fight was not that one-sided. Oh. Um, yeah. So uh, of all of your fights, what would you say was your most gratifying victory? Well, I'd have to – actually, I have to give that to the, the knockout over Slobodan Kachar. I was a slight underdog to win the title, and I, I – <laughs> you'll get this in about a second. I used to laugh when, when I was a kid. I was a teenager. And girls would cry when they were happy. And when I knocked him out and I raised my hands, I just walked into the sports history books. I started to tear up for a minute. And I tried to wipe it away real quick because I, I don't want anybody to think I'm soft. <laughs> but I, I, I just I realized the enormity of what I had just done when I set out to do at the age of 10. And I always told people it will take me 14 years to win that title. 14 years later, almost to the month. Wow. Wow. Yeah, congratulations. Congratulations. You know, 
Well, what you, know, what what is, Jeremy, you know this, Jeremy. You know this as well as anybody. Nobody knows about when you got to get up and you got to run five miles with blistering, bleeding feet. Nobody knows your, your jaw dislocated. You got to spar the next day. Okay, your nose broke. You still got to spar. Your eardrums are broke. I mean, it's every day. Your ribs is bruised. You still got to you got to show up. So Nobody yeah. sees those days. They just see the days, the glory days. Yeah. yeah so that's what I want to talk about. What what was that thing behind the energy that drove you to be the best? I wanted to be in the history books because I'm not religious. I wanted <laughs> to leave a footprint. I wanted to leave something behind when I'm gone. Wow. And I, it just dro it drove me. It, my, even my mother, there were days I would come home from the gym and I would fall asleep in my food and just be bleeding in through my nose on the table. And my mother would say, son, you don't have Oh, we lost you for a second there. You went mute. And you said, son. Just one of those things. Oh, there we go. We just we just lost what you said. You went, uh, it went mute. You, what did your mother say? Oh, yeah. Some, somebody, somebody tried to call in. Okay. My mom used to say to me sometimes when I was, you know, I'd come home, I would fall asleep in my food. Oh. And I would be so exhausted, so tired. Or I would have, a, my nose would be bleeding or my eardrums would be broken. She'd say, son, you don't have to do this. I said, Maya, yes, I, yes, I do. That's I don't believe I don't believe in God like you do. I gotta have I have to leave behind a Bobby Chess footprint. Well, that's an interesting yeah. point, you know, because you're you're part of you have a, your Mensa, which is your IQ is 98th percentile and above. Um, what? Why did you not go into something? Because you could have left the footprint a lot of different ways, right? And I'm not saying I'm glad you boxed, but what? made you go this route as opposed to using your brain, which was obviously just as, as heavily armed as your fists. I had four partial pre-med scholarships to go to medical schools around the country. Okay. But, and cause I was, I was as a young athlete, I was at, I was hurt so often always going you know, when you always go the extra mile, you always get hurt. You always, you always do. <clears throat> it just turns out that way. And I spent a lot of time in orthopedic surgeons and orthopedic doctor's offices cracked this broken at this book at this whatever and i got to enjoy the guys and then i started to be able to diagnose myself by the time i was in my early 20s wow. <laughs> doctor, said, doctor said you don't need me <laughs> yeah. but it was just it was just uh it was just one of those things because i knew i couldn't do them both is there much, any much work on both sides <clears throat> is there anybody else in your family who's got that high level of intelligence that you have i believe my dad did um, but he was also a little bit of a sociopath, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure how that relates to me. But my brother's my brother Vince is a straight A student, graduated uh, Rutgers 4.0, Columbia 4.0. Uh, I am. I, I always tease him. I say you should take the test. He said, I'm not as smart as you. He said I just have more book knowledge. Wow. Uh, okay. He's so, but he's a very bright kid. Very bright kid. Do you do you regret? Uh, boxing in any way is, is there any part of you or a, is there a big part of you that wishes you did something else or are you completely happy with your decision no i'm good i can if i die tomorrow i did i did what i came here to do i only mm. have one thing left in my life i need to do make sure my daughter grows up has a nice life she's engaged to get married now you just got to make sure that the rest of her life is okay and i'm good to go yeah, uh, that's a great way to be you have one child i have one child yeah Originally, I wanted five. I had one. I quit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, <clears throat> what does a day in the life uh, today look like for for Bobby Chess? Well, I'm on disability. I had a lot of problems with car, with another car accident in 2007. I got double hip replacement. I needed. I have uh, herniated discs in my spine. I have degenerative disc disease in my back, arthritis in my back and my neck. Bursitis in my shoulders and my another knee, my knees torn. Holy so shit. when I walk, when I look, I walk. You can't tell when I'm walking. You can't tell when you're looking at me. But I can't, I can't go to, I can't go to war like I used to. <laughs> but uh, I still keep myself. I'm losing <clears throat> five pounds in my last fight weight, so I'm not heavy, not too heavy, and I'm all right. Wow, good, that's wow. good. Um, and uh, what what kind of business are you into now? Is that, or are you just on rehab? Well, right now I'm on a, I'm done pension disability pension but i have mm -hmm. uh, been offered a couple of jobs to broadcast again so i may be back in the broadcasting booth which is a We'd great love, place yeah, to be. yeah we would I, love to see you there. i was gonna ask you, you know you were yeah. a great broadcaster with showtime um why did you stop doing that 
Well, I got fired for telling the truth. I got told to stop telling the truth and I couldn't compromise my integrity. I didn't know any other way to talk to the people other than straight. And they used my DUI as a problem. I said, wait a minute. You can, they said, well, this is too much. So wait, the first, the first three DUIs, you didn't mind those three, but the fourth one, that was the limit. What, <laughs> what, what truth was there a specific instance of something specific that you said or was- yeah, they kept telling me to stop saying that there's an agenda. See, you, you, when, whenever you watch a fight, let's just say you watch a fight and fighter A is kicking the crap out of fighter B and he does it for almost every round. And at the end of the fight, fighter B wins. There are only two logical explanations for the outcome of that. The judges were incompetent and stupid and don't know what they're doing. Therefore, they should never judge again. Or the fix was in for the, pro- for the fight by the producer <coughs> who pays the judges. For the next fight. Oh. And no, he, he keeps he, he keeps the guy without a loss and he makes more money down the road. And so they, then, you know, the, the network said to me, stop saying that. People keep asking us, what's the agenda? I said, the agenda is simple. The people that can't follow that, the fact that they have to ask you, well, you know as well as I do, some of this stuff isn't right. Yeah, but you can't say that on TV. Why? Then I look like an idiot. Then I look like the guy who's lying. Wow. I can't say that the guy. I can't say that the guy who got beat up. Uh, yeah, he actually won the fight. No, he didn't. He got his ass kicked. So they basically told you to stop suggesting that that there's crooked shit going on. Yes, that's that's. I mean, I wonder if it would be that way in, in today's day. You probably could. Yep. Yes, it will. It will. It'll, it'll, it'll matter. It'll never change. You think so? It's not. Yeah. It'll never. It'll change. never, it'll never change. <clears throat> He's here. And I used to tell him. I said, to be real simple, follow the money. Think exactly. about this. You have a fighter. I'll tell you what. You can watch the tape. His first fight, Floyd Mayweather Jr. First fight he had against, I can't remember, Spanish guy. He got beat. Castillo. He got beat seven rounds to five clean. Castillo. Yep. Got, yep, Castillo. Got beat clean. Seven rounds to five clean. After the fight, it was a split decision he won. That's when you know when an undefeated fighter wins a split decision, you know he lost. Mm. It just kept the legend alive because it makes money for the business. It makes now money. he beat him in the rematch, no problem. But he lost the first one. Mm. I was shocked that he lost the first one, but I think he just didn't train for it. <clears throat> wow. Yeah. Um. So fifty. Go ahead, Joe. You got fifty-two professional fights. Say again. Fifty-two yeah. professional fights. 44 and 8. 44 how, wins, how, 8 losses. How big, how big was the amateur career? <clears throat> Minuscule. It was, it was t- I had, I was. Uh, 26 and 2. Yeah, 26 and 2, but 24 of those fights were junior Olympic fights. Oh. Okay. And why is that? If you could explain to people who are going to be listening, why is that significant? Well, it's significant because when you're junior Olympic, you're under 16. It's 10 and 11 fight each other. 12 to me, 10, 11, 12 and 13, and 14 and 15 fight each other. Once you're 16, you can go in the open AAU. You can fight in the Golden Gloves. You can fight in a, you know, the grown-up tournament, so to speak. You're not a kid anymore. I won the yeah. state junior Olympics every time I fought in them. Fought in them twice. I fought in the, the every time I fought in the regional t- titles. I won them, and I finished third in the, in the country. I got wow. a bronze medal. Um, so, you know, I, I did. I again, I, I was trying. Not in the in the amateurs. I just I love the thrill of the competition. I really did. And when I was a very young, I really thought that I had something special. All the pros would say to me, "You're different." And this is something. This is really funny because white people don't get it. But <laughs> I, I have soul. I have soul. <laughs> I tried to explain to a reporter once. He said, he said, I don't understand this soul thing. Call you the white boy with soul. What is that? I don't, what is, I don't understand it. <laughs> so I tried like 10 examples. I couldn't get him to understand it. <clears throat> then I got one last example. I said, if you don't get it with this example, then that's one of the reasons why you can't get it because you're white. You got the, uh, so I said <clears throat> to him, here you, you go. I, I told this to you the other day. <clears throat> you and my brother Eric are damn near freaking twins. That's funny. 
and we're 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 Irish and black, and you and my brother look like bloody twins. That's possible. It's, it's, it's possible. But when I was talking to this reporter, you what you'll get a full kick out of this. I finally gave an example. I said, Larry Bird, one of the best bo basketball players of all time, picture perfect, technician, great. Mm -hmm. True. I said, now Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan, you can't put in, you can't put a name on that. He goes, his body goes in two different directions at the same time, then comes back together behind you, and he dunks the ball. I said, that is so. He said, okay. He said, now I think I get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it was just a different thing. Just a different yeah, thing. Yeah, it, it is. I think you do need to be a good fighter. For the most part, you do need a little soul, a little rhythm, a little. You know, for the most, you part. have to have, you have to have some rhythm. You know why? All the stand ups all the stand-up straight head guys, it, most of them have great chins because they're going to get hit because they're not moving. And they have to be phenomenal punchers or they're not going to, you know, they're not going to make it. And I just got lucky. I, I, went, I went to a gym where I learned under black and Hispanic teachers. The guy who was the trainer in the gym taught me how to jab. That's it. After that, I said, look, I, I got this. That's I just, the, the, most, the most important punch you got, the jab. Right, what, but he didn't even show me. He did, yeah, but he didn't even show me how to do that right. <laughs> um, I, I learned how to do. The, I learned how to do the power jabs. You know, where you step into with your body behind you, or you do the yeah. you do the quick jabs that just to, just for the points, just to get through, just to find the distance, that kind of stuff. Um, I was going to ask you. Speaking of hard punchers, you know, you fought some pretty hard punching guys, especially when you stepped up the heavyweight. Who was the hardest puncher that just really stood out that you've ever been in the ring with? Okay, I didn't fight him, but I was in the ring with him many times. Ray Merciless, Ray Merciless, Mercer. Woo! Ray Mercer me. hit me with a right hand in the gym once. I spar with Ray all the time. <clears throat> Ray hit me with a right hand once. I weighed 195 at the time. He weighed about 235. He hit me with a right hand. He was right in front of me. And I couldn't find him. <laughs> and I knew I had. To, I knew to get my ass. I knew to get myself out of. Get out of the way. Move. Move. Duck. Bob. We give feet. Get out of here. And I recovered Dude, quickly. That was the one. <coughs> excuse me. One thing about me, I recovered quickly. He. I know exactly what you mean, bro. Ooh, it was a scary. Yeah. Dude. yeah. You know, we. I, got, I got I'll, tell what, I'll, I'll tell you what. One day I was out. One day I was out <clears> to <throat> dinner with Ray. Ray and a friend of mine. We were having dinner. And my friend said to Ray, "He said, uh, hey, Ray, who ever hit you the hardest?'" He said, "Ask your friend." <laughs> I said, "It wasn't me, Ray." He said, "Yes, it was." <laughs> Really? I hit Ray. Yeah. As I got a little bigger, I hit Ray with a couple of shots. I got him good. So, uh, you know, we, we both worked with each other very well, though. He's a great guy. We, um, yeah, he seems like he could do. We had uh, Hassim Rahman, who's an old friend of ours, on the, on, on the podcast. And he had fought uh, both Corey Sanders and Evander Holofield, who you both fought. And he told us that Corey Sanders was the hardest puncher he's ever been in there with. Uh, what do, you, do you agree with you that? You know why? I do agree with that. I'll tell you why. There's a very, very subtle thing to Corey Sanders' power. He's 245 pounds, but he punches at the speed of a cruiserweight. He hit, he's fast. His jabs are fast. His, his uh, left hands are fast because it's southpaw. But he hits you from some angles. I mean, at one point in time in the first round, he hit me so many times, I just took a knee because I couldn't get out of the way of him. I couldn't get out of his way. I just took a knee. I said, I got to rest. I got to rest this one off. And after the second round, they, they stopped it because I just wasn't responding well. Was, I, you know, I was 36. My body had been through a lot. I said, all right, I'm calling it a day. I'm retired. And what about <laughs> against the Panther? Because Hasim and a few other people, we, we, we talked to Chris Bird. We talked to a few people who fought Evander, kept bringing up the headbutting that he would do. The, did, did, one, was Evander strong? And two, did you see the headbutting moves with you as well? All right, I got to put this in context for you. He wasn't that strong. He didn't hit that hard, but he did use his elbows and his and his head all the time. He always did. Um, it's funny. Here's what I here's what I knew. I knew for a fact. I had two things going for me, and by going for me, that that Evander would underestimate me. Mm. <laughs> I'm not an I'm not a legitimate heavyweight, and I'm white. Mm. He's going to underestimate me for both things. Yep. He's going to not train for this fight. So I just got out. I got out last in the first five rounds. 
and then he's not gonna he's not gonna make it. He's not gonna make it to the finish line. I know this. So in the first round, he threw 98 punches. I'm sorry, he threw uh well, anyway, he threw more punches than he'd ever thrown as a heavyweight in his career in the first two rounds. But I was still standing there. He hit me one shot in the second round, and Larry Murchie even said it to me. He said, But hey, man, if I just hit Bobby Chess with a Ray left hook and Bobby Chess said, nice shot. It wasn't that hard. He, he, he did not hit that hard. No. But at the same time, as he started to get after the after the second round, my body, my eyes started to burn. I mean, I mean, burn, burn. Why? Not like I got, not like I got sweat in him. Well, my vision the day before the fight at the doctor's the ophthalmologist, 2015, both eyes. Oh shit. Two days wow. after the 45, 2050. I'm, yeah, I spy got glasses on. Oh, I would never wear glasses. I, I would 2015. I could see. I could read the. the I could read the menu from across the room. <laughs> and something. As a matter of fact, I got a call. I got a call the day after the fight from Bert Cooper. Bert Cooper said, as soon as I dropped him, he said, in the next round, he said, my eyes burned so bad, I couldn't see anything. So, oh, you know, you know what it is then. What is it? I found out two years later from the state troopers what it was. What they said it was Tabasco sauce. Tabasco sauce? You're kind of... Acidic. We're losing you. That's, that, that's losing what they said. You. We're losing you, Bobby. You're losing me. Uh, okay. All right. How come? I don't know. It's that, like, that? Your video's frozen, but now your audio's getting coming back. Well, your video's frozen several times on me. I don't know why, yeah. but it has. Um, yeah, like yours is frozen right now. Yeah, your audio's. Can, can are you sitting where you've been sitting the whole time? I've been sitting here the whole time. So it was the clearest place in the room. Weird. Yeah, a little see, bit. Your, your video froze for me for a second. Let's give it a second. See if it comes back. Um, you there? I'm there. Okay. So you said Tabasco sauce. That's what the police officer, the state trooper, told me. He yeah. said that he he had heard a New Jersey state trooper. He said he heard from some people in the New York Police Department that when his the gloves got so they were supposed to take the gloves immediately, right, and put them in plastic right. bags and have them tested. Now they lost the gloves for two days, which pissed me off. Then they found them. Then they tested them. And they said it was inconclusive. Now think about this: there's either sweat on those gloves or there's a chemical on those gloves. There's no such thing as inconclusive under those circumstances. Yeah, but yeah. That, that's where the money was. Money was with Evander, not with me. So let me let me get this straight. Evan, Evander would put Tabasco sauce on his gloves and no, not, his trainer did. His trainer, but Evander must have known. Sure, he did. And he won't he admit did, to it. And he did this with uh, Cooper as well. Hold up. <clears throat> well, hold up. How do you watch not as it, a watch fighter? Watch how do you as a, well, listen, listen. How do you as a fighter have gloves on and don't touch your own face? Good point. Well, you touch your face by you know it, but he 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 don't touch it that much, especially with a guy that size of me. He didn't touch him that much, and even if he touched him, he didn't he touch his cheeks. That's no big deal. Touch mm -hmm. his chin, his lips, your nose, no big deal. In your eyes, in your cornea, yeah, but, that's a big you, deal. Well, once your once your pores open, it doesn't make a difference. What do you touch? It's sure all it no, That's not true. It's not true. It's uh, that the the. the specific substance is isolated to an area you can't it doesn't it's not uh it's not equatable with it being moving to all the different areas it only infects the area it's landing on it don't if, if you don't hit somebody if you, if you don't stick fingers in your own eye you're not going to get your eyes are not going to get problem wow <laughs> that's if that's true i mean i know your eyes are burning so your eyes definitely burn we're not gonna right there's no <laughs> argument there but if, if that's true that's that's really i mean jesus Head buddy. Well, watch this. Watch this. The very next fight he had was against Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson saw how bad he looked against me. Mike Tyson didn't train for the first fight either. Mm -hmm. So he didn't train real hard. He like when he, he coasted a little, and then look what it cost him. Wow. And and the second fight was it was its own uh nasty thing. <laughs> yeah, that was crazy. Um so did you commentate? Because I did you commentate any of those big fights? I don't really remember the commentating career that well. I did both both Tyson Holyfield fights. You did wow! That's I did I did both of them. Yeah, I did both of them. So you did the. I worked, yeah, I did Showtime for ten years from 
nine, from uh, 1992 to 2003. Ten okay. years and ten years and four months. Let me uh, so so hold on, hold on. Sitting ringside to Holyfield and Tyson, how did that sound? How did what sound? How did Tyson and Holyfield sitting ringside to that? How how did it sound? What the what do those punches sound like? What does that? What does that? Energy well, you sound? could you you could you could hear the thuds up close because we're sitting like <clears throat> literally. We could put our hands on the ring. Yeah, um, I know where you're sitting. Yeah, it's uh you know you you get a different perspective than watching it through the TV. You can't call a fight or watch a fight on TV sometimes in close fights and be perfectly accurate. There's inside fighting that you can't see that well from the outside. Mm -hmm. Depends on your angle too. Sometimes you're that you have a fighter who's back to him who's scoring inside. It's <laughs> difficult, but at the same time, it's awesome. I love be I love being ringside. Yeah, but you being a fighter and an ex world champion, watching that at, at ringside is is a completely different experience than somebody in the second row or third row that doesn't have never fought. Yeah, that's, that's true. That. And I can actually I can actually see and sometimes sense when a fighter is starting to get tired or starting to lag, or maybe got hurt and is trying to hide it. Look, sometimes you'll see a guy take a body shot and you go, <coughs> all right, he, sh he, he shook it off. He didn't shake it off. He, he didn't shake it off and it shows up later. Yeah, Jeremy and I talk about this a lot. You know, um, I, I fought before Jeremy, obviously. I, we feel like it's a real, real disgrace that the majority of announcers, commentators, never fought at all. You know, and- well, How can you call, how, like Larry Merchant, <clears throat> how can you call him an expert analyst when he never got hit in the face once. I hate that motherfucker. How can you do I, that? I agree. I totally You can't agree. do it. You can't do it. Look, I respect the fact that they have pretty interesting and good opinions. Some of their opinions are pretty well researched. But he can't understand what it's like to get hit in the solar plexus and all the air leaves your body and you can't move, but you got to move because you got to get out of the way or you're going to get bulldozed over. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things. You can get hit in the eye. You get hit under the rib cage. You get a thousand different things go wrong and i remember um, there's a fight oh man i'm telling you like those mother efforts don't know what the fuck they're they talking don't, about. but that's why they don't know how to that's why they don't know how to react to it they come up with something stupid what um they don't know how to react to it besides the tyson holofield fight which is probably the the most uh the one that stands out the most what other fight as a commentator stands out? What other, you know, maybe legendary fights did you do that you could think of that stand out to you? Commentating. Well, I, did, I did a lot of Julio Cesar Chavez's fights. Uh, uh, who was, what's his name? The, uh, the body snatcher, Mike McCallum, did one of his. Ooh, shit. Nigel Ben overseas. Yeah, I mean, there was, there was a lot of guys. And, you know, it's Tony Tucker was fighting... For, for Don King back then, Don King had a lot of heavyweights. So these guys, Oliver McCall was also a friend of mine, you know, winning the world title. And I got to see these guys and call them. And I was friends with a lot of them and other ones, other guys. I just, I knew them. I just knew them. Um, did, you, did you, did you ever, did you ever have somebody ask you to call the fight a little different so that people could see something different? No, no, nobody ever. Nobody ever about it. Say again. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, I know. No one, no one. I never, I never called a fight. To, here's the thing: that makes me look like an idiot. If if something's happening and I'm calling something else, a matter of fact, you you laugh at this. I called him out on it because I used to I used to announce with him, Ferdy Pacheco. Ferdy Pacheco one time was talking about a certain fight. I forget who it was now. And the fighter, he kept saying, he's coming on, he's coming on, and he was getting his ass kicked. And he lost the fight by a runaway unanimous decision. And, and Ferdy said, I wonder what I was, I couldn't, I don't know what I was looking at. So I called him out on it. I said, he, I said, what were you looking at? He said, well, look, he said, the other guy was actually a better fighter. I just thought he was going to come from behind and win. So I just kind of wished that. So I said, no, you can't say something you're wishing for to the people. You got to tell them what yeah. they're seeing. It makes that's, you look stupid. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, I just thought that was insane. Well, I, I say that I say that because so many times nowadays in boxing that <clears throat> the the I'm going to call them hosts or the announcers, but they're they're they're, they're guiding what you see. I know exactly their work. what you. I, I know yeah. exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Hey, how about this? This you'll appreciate this. I had a guy when I was fighting in Total in Ice World early in my career. 
he was blind. And he used to send me letters and he used to say, you're, you're the best blind boxing fan. So I wrote him back a letter. Eventually I got his number and I said, how can you watch a fight if you're blind? How do you judge a fight if you're blind? He said, well, I listened to the announcers. I said, what if the announcer's an idiot? And one day he called me up, he called me up after one of my fights in Ice World. And he said, uh, you had a rough night, huh? So what are you talking about? He well, so-and-so said you didn't look, didn't look that good. I said, so-and-so is an idiot who was an announcer, but he was wrong. I didn't knock out a guy. Everybody expected me to knock out in three rounds. I knocked him out in five. Mm. Right. So, so all of a sudden, and I don't now, know. Now that's a problem. Well, but that's what announcers do. They influence people. They do. The power of the, power of the mic. Um, yes. Did, did, and I'm not asking for numbers, obviously, but I was always curious. Did they pay decently as, as, for, for commentating or did they not? Yeah, I, they paid, I, was paid, I was paid well. Good, good. You deserve it, you know? And I, and I feel like it should be tiered pay. People like you should get way more because of your background, you know? But they don't do that. Well, I was, I was, I was well paid. I got, I got five figures in fight. Great. Yeah, I got wow. five figures in fight. It was, uh, it, was, it, was a good, it was a good career. Um, so I, I, I'd asked you before you, your most gratifying victory, so I'm curious, what was your most disappointing fight? My most disappointing fight, probably my first loss to Charles Williams, Prince Charles Williams. Losing wow. my title was losing my title was a blow to mm. my ego, mm. and it was a blow to my just to, just to my hard work ethic and everything I did. I just lost it. Mm. Uh, well, Charles, Charles, I remember, I remember him. Yeah, he could fight. He beat, me, fight. beat me twice. Only yeah. guy to beat me twice. Yeah. <clears throat> you yeah. know, and that's my that's my father's name. So it's like that's why I would watch him. Like, Dad, look, you're fighting. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, it was really appreciate talking to you, man. Um we appreciate it. You're such an interesting dude. We'd definitely like to have you back. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. Listen. My man's got he's got my number already, no problem. You call me up, we'll, we'll make it we'll make it work. Well for appreciate sure. it, man. Thank you. And you are a wealth of knowledge and thank you for your experience. And, and thank you for your championships and all the fights that, and for looking like my older brother. And <laughs> if you're ever back Marco and Jeremy, you guys have a great time. You have a great night. Thank you, man. Take care. Take thank care, you. bro. Bye. Cheers.